How does one get in touch with one's instinctive roots? Well, of course, first of all, we all need to understand that it's the norm to lose contact with them. And we lose contact with them as we become conscious of ourselves as a psychological being, as an individual. Uh, and so this will happen gradually over childhood initially as we begin to form our identity and we differentiate out from the psychology of the parents. We will be living an instinctive level of consciousness, a very archaic one initially. Uh, hence the way that this is dressed up psychodynamically in the literature, in Jungian and Freudian, for example, literature, the relationship to the parents, uh, principally the the mother, of course, as we've discussed before, with, with uh, a female caregiver. But instincts are more than just those things. The problem is, as I say, when you develop an identity of yourself as a psychosocial being, you're being imprinted psychoculturally and psychosocially at that point. And then a gap forms, a separation. And in the context, for example, of the personal myth, which we're going to discuss on another occasion with a supporting manual, there are a whole general class of neuroses that you could call individuation neuroses, which in effect is a separation of ourselves as conscious ego, ego identities, away from the through line of our life that we are born with and that is anticipated genomically. The value of having far memory back to childhood, amongst other things, is the capacity then to begin to experience things consciously as the instincts themselves would primarily want you to experience them. So there will be an intensity of things like colour, light, sound and such like. And these things can illustrate our childhood, they form the background, the way that we interact with the environment. Bearing in mind that we're an ancient species and we have ancestors as well, a lot of our learning and our imprinting, if not all of it to some extent, is prepared for in the genome, in your biology. And patterns of adaptation are released like a time release mechanism from the genome. And this is what Aristotle, for example, meant by teleology, which is that the end is anticipated at the beginning. And the beginning for us, of course, is the beginning of our life. And this process, therefore, is underway before we become conscious of ourselves as a psychological and a psychosocial being. So by the time we do become conscious, there's already a separation from the archaic side of our psyche. Provided we don't stray, stress too far away, then we can maintain a good state of balance. But once we do, we, we do get problems. I mentioned before in a, in a previous video an experience I had as a child that stuck with me my whole life. It had to do with uh, my mum, my mother, who was a very introverted sort of woman and a, a strange canvas for a, a young male child to imprint upon because of that and the backdrop of where we lived was um, right on the edge of the countryside it was like it just extended forever as far as I could see it did and there was a stream at the bottom of the garden and it ran from left to right and there was a water meadow beyond that that flooded and there was this huge tree like a monolith the locals called it the crow's tree because it was full of ravens and that drew a lot of energy, it appeared, from the environment. Um, there were open rolling fields, uh, there were ponds, and there was the procession of the seasons. Uh, there was a dairy herd that would come down to the bottom of the garden, we would drink out, out of the, the stream. Uh, there was even the local Lord Leverhulme, those, those of you who are familiar with um, that particular person, he's behind Unilever, that massive conglomerate international uh, industry. His fox hunt would gallop past our back garden. And for a child, this was an amazing spectacle. And uh, the changes of the seasons and the weather were just were just painted like, like, like this living canvas. And my mother was somehow part of that. Very different from her father, who was a very down-to-earth ISTJ with very little imagination. 
and my brother who was uh, someone who was undifferentiated with respect to extroversion and therefore adaptation externally he just he was seven years and still is seven years older than me he kind of blended into the background and I was an intuitive none of them were and my intuition was extroverted and it was all over this environment all over this canvas and in an attempt to understand it I would process it through my relationship to my mother because for some reason I believe she understood it all she probably didn't but I believe that she did and that's probably for instinctive reasons partly because as a male child you anticipate biologically and therefore it's completely outside of your control your adaptation to the world through your primary caregiver in my case that was my mother and I learned from her what relating was and she related to things it seemed to me as if they were mysteries and if as if there were secrets everywhere and you can only understand these by entering into these mysteries but she was so introverted I couldn't catch her she was receding into herself all the time all the time and it was like chasing a ghost but what I could see was the environment so my intuition went out into the environment and I felt and I can remember this <coughs> consciously that there were spirits in the environment that were related somehow psychologically to me as an emerging personality and that, that these these had a, an innate power, a force to them. And of course now I appreciate that because I was so young and I could biologically anticipate a future, I had no past. And consciousness was emerging moment by moment in relationship to this environment. And of course that meant that the past was fascinating because everything I could learn that would help me adapt was in the past and my mum was really interested in history and there was a film on once and it was just happened to be King Arthur and there he was pulling out the sword from the stone and I knew what a sword was it was some kind of big knife you know and I, I'd seen like Robin Hood on the telly and things like that but I was still very young and hadn't fully understood what was going on although I appreciated the idea of the forest and the green wood the fact that they were dressed in Lincoln green and they had this amazing weapon the English longbow that was somehow some kind of totem for power to do with the Robin Hood figure. He had this power over these other guys who were the baddies who were carrying swords. And suddenly there's a goodie carrying a sword. He was a king. I didn't know what a king was. So I asked her, what's a king, mum? And she said in an understated way, which always produces projection in an attempt to understand it. Oh, the, the king is very important. He's over all of us. He rules over us. What does that mean, Mum? Oh, he's at the top. He's very important. And at that point, I had a connection with an impersonal memory. That's how I can describe it, which I now understand to be the sign stimulus, if you like, as an ethologist would call it, which was my mum telling me this. And then an innate understanding of what it must mean to be a king biologically it had to do with dominance hierarchies it had to do with a larger scale family the king was the father of us all and somehow it turns out from talking to my mum after this as well the king was connected to the land because he owned the land owned what does owned mean oh well it's his and we can only have bits of it but we have to look up to the king this was the way she was speaking to me a young child so that then seems to suggest that the king was some kind of what I would now understand to be a <coughs> deity. This was someone who had immense power, like a father, but even more powerful, more powerful than my dad, my ISTJ dad, and more powerful than anybody else I knew. All my friends' fathers, no, they weren't the king. The king was something special. And the king somehow, and I felt this instinctively, embodied the land. And I could look out the window, and I could see the natural land. And I talked to my mum about that and say, well, what used to be over there, mum, because our house is new? What you? She'd say, nothing. That land is untouched. It's been like that for centuries. And I couldn't understand what centuries meant. And it was like, oh, remote past, long, long, long time ago. 
And I said, well, did nobody live there? Oh, yes, people lived there, but they didn't build houses like we have. Wow, what does that mean? You know? And I was being drawn into this understanding and appreciation that the, the, that the land was ancient and therefore was a reflection of the psyche and that the king, whoever the king was, was deeply connected to that. And then, of course, as you acquire the idea formally of what a religion is, because my mum was superstitiously Christian in a nominal sense, she came from an Anglican background, but her, her own animus... And the influences on her were deeply superstitious. And some of that came from her own mother's animus, my grandmother, my maternal grandmother in the way that she was. And I was aware of the, of, of the superstition that would exchange between them and how that would affect them and their behaviour and therefore how we were expected to behave. I now know that a lot of this superstition came from, literally came from the 19th century. It was, like, it was that far back, which is not long really, but when you're tiny very small and you're just developing your own consciousness these things seem very very remote so I got the impression then that the king was some kind of figure he was male I was male oh that, that's a good one um, and then of course you hear that there's a queen and that they meet and they marry and they have children who are called princes and princesses and they inherit the land the land is given to them and that gave me an impression of how things transfer through generations culturally and the importance of all of that so th that, that struck me deeply years later when I'd learned a lot lot more uh, but of course these early experiences had imprinted upon me and formed the template for my understanding and yearning with respect to, to learning about history and later psychology and in particular depth psychology, comparative religion, anthropology, all of these things were seeded at, at, at that earlier time. And I learned a lot more which made me understand what that ancestral spirit really was and that it is actually biological, it is written into our DNA because of our genome and because of our instincts. That these anticipations are whole situations that are passed on as narratives, as myths, as folklore, the passed down within families and then when you go out into culture from your early learning from from your family you, you, you're told even more you're given more structured examples of what things are with relation to making meaning of life and of experience and then I realized that the image the imago of the king and becoming the king was actually a mirror of your own personal development and achievements of the best potential that you have so it was, if you like, an attractor culturally which draws your genetic potential towards it psychologically. And that then is individuation. So the meaning of being the king is very, very important. And as I learned more and more about the, the history of where we lived as well and its importance to the Celts, for example, the, the, the pre-Roman occupants of the area, and how actually it was a sacred area, there are Druid sites, ancient Druid sites nearby where we lived, they're still there, mm. where Christian churches were built in the Roman period occupying that ancient site. Um, I really began to understand how important that connection was to the ancestral psyche and, and the importance too of perhaps tracing your own DNA, mm. having DNA tests, find out where your Y chromosome is if you're male. Uh, what your autosomal background is and then connecting that with that ancestral spirit and how it's moved through that of course connected to Jung's ideas of the collective unconscious and of archetypes but it didn't pull me too far away from biology because I had to have evidence for the reality of these things that couldn't be reduced just to psychosocial conditioning and learning you see there's a gap what the Tibetans would call a bardo the in-between state between biology and cultural where psychology operates but within that gap too other things operate things that are either good or not so good the good things are where you're going to find your creativity we're going to you're going to find the best of your emotions but also where you're going to create all of your neuroses all of your maladaptations this is the world where your own individual personal myth operates so it's very, very important to understand the past, in my view. As you get older, it changes, because by the time you reach our age, 
then we have a past, but we don't have much of a future. And you'll find that your own psyche begins to anticipate the future more than wanting to understand the past. And at that point, objectively, you see yourself as part of a timeline that involves your personal psyche, but also involves the very, very deep structures, even beneath those that are called transpersonal by some psychologists, because you're going down into the, into the genome and the biology itself, and you realize that your ancestry and the people who will follow you are connected to the same genome, the same patterns, the same innate patterns. You can call these archetypes if you wish, but remember if you do, that the exact form that they take, the archetypal images, are conditioned culturally and socially, but they originate in your biogramma. It's that deep. And when it comes to getting over maladaptations in life, defaulting back to instinct is so important because it tends to clarify things out very, very quickly and gives you a focus to readapt. And you'll also find that in the gap between instincts and personal adaptations and maladaptations, the world of the complexes, individual complexes, family complexes, psychosocial and cultural complexes, in that gap you will find what Jung called archetypes. And Jung called them the spontaneous self-portrait of instincts. In other words, the archetypes are produced by instincts as deep structures, perhaps even deep structure complexes in the sense that the form that they take are local. If you can tap into this, you'll learn a great deal and you'll avoid a lot of the issues that can come later, such as becoming too swallowed up in imagery that other people have created or that are local with respect to your culture. Find your own personal myth rather than a collective one. Then you can understand yourself. So that's important. But going back to the, uh, the original point about the king, the, there's no point having a king without a queen. There is no masculine energy without feminine. Biologically, this is the case. It's the way it is. And the connection between the two is rooted metaphorically, aragolically in alchemy, as well as in psychology. And that's the bedrock for everything. And you've, you've pointed this out, Paul, haven't you, with uh, the fairy tales, with, with uh, Bluebeard, and with the presence of instincts in those as well. Yeah, um, and with, to be honest with you, I was thinking about a number of other, other yeah, things fine, yeah. as you were talking, um, yeah. rather than that specifically. Um, my, my experience has been very different to yours, obviously. Yeah. Um, and um, if it was to think about uh, sort of the idea um, of a queen within my, say, within my own context, within my mm. own family, um, Sadly, none of the my female relatives uh, lived up to that remotely. No. Um, and uh, yet, like you say, nonetheless, there's still that understanding of what of what that means. Um, and I guess then you have to find it uh, in other forms uh, or in other people out mm. there in the culture. And sometimes you hear. Um, young women these days particularly uh probably less so in my day but i have noticed it on social media and mm. that that they refer to one another or or oh, to yeah, yeah. um specific females with within their peer group as being queens sometimes mm. Mm. uh probably back in my day it was probably more just a um a term of affection say for an older woman mm. would call a younger woman a queen and maybe there was some kind of deeper acknowledgement there going on as well mm. um but you see it amongst younger women today as well yeah as if again they understand innately instinctively what that means and so they'll select somebody uh, from their own peer group to carry yeah. that that title mm. so to speak and uh, presumably it's the same in male peer, peer groups as well yeah. in so much as um, whichever woman is considered to be the top female the mm. best the most powerful the most whatever mm. uh, then you will get that kind of um, uh, I guess, sort of nomination going on. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's about, uh, about peer groups, it it's is. dominance, it's yeah. about rank. You, you can apply all of those ideas and that feeds into psychiatry and into ethology, evolutionary psychology. They're all different lenses for looking at what is essentially just an instinctive program that yeah. gets processed through a culture yeah. in, a, in a particular time. Yeah. But um, in the Celtic period, for example, if a king didn't do his job properly, they got shut. And in Gawain and the Green Knight, you have an echo of that in a medieval poem of a much older tradition, which uh, originally was Irish and then brought through the area where we live, actually, into England and Wales, where we live was once part of Wales. In fact, the whole country was once because Wales, the Welsh people are the original Britons as such before the Roman uh, invasion. If... Um, Gawain, anyway, get back to Gawain and the Green Knight. The idea of the beheading, if uh, a king did not fertilise the land properly, did not have a proper relationship to the soil and its fecundity, he would be ritually beheaded and replaced. And Gawain is a solar hero. He has a halo, and that's based on an ancient Celtic, Irish and Welsh deity. Um, the Welsh one is called Guri. Um, and it means he who has her like rains, golden light, sunlight coming out. He was a saviour deity as well, for that matter. But Gwain is based on him, and his strength increases to midday and then de decreases towards midnight because he follows the sun. But also he re he represents the new sun, the birth of the new year. And the red knight in that story, Bertilak, represents the old year and the death of the old sun. And Bertilak in the story, as you know, you're familiar with it, um, James, uh, appears as the green man, a spirit, Viridius, if you like, uh, and challenges Arthur's knights. In fact, he challenges the king first, Arthur, to have at him with this double-headed axe. Uh, and he is beheaded, but he picks up his head because you can't kill the cycles of nature, they're eternal. Um, and this, this is a throwback, it goes back, and Gawain then is challenged as well. Anyway, without going into that particular story, that, that is a throwback to this idea that kings would be sacrificed uh, if they did not embody the land. And the feminine aspect in, in that period was sovereignty. The goddess sovereignty, the queen, was also the fecundity of the land. So the marriage between the king and the queen had to do with the fertility, literally, of the land and its fecundity. The present sovereign we have in the UK now, there, there's a very interesting case study as to whether she actually fits that archetype. I'll call it an archetype. It's certainly a cultural archetype, a collective mm. representation. How long has it been since a monarch in England, Britain, across the, the, the broader British Isles, has actually fulfilled that ancient archetypal role of being married to the land and to the people and to representing the people in that way fully does this present monarch she's a woman and a lot of people would project the great mother and the anima if you like onto her as a screen in the same way as i was saying earlier that a child will, pro will project onto its mother and look for the reflection back off the mother for meaning and parents rarely live up to that parents parents rarely live up to very, it very very rarely and, and i would suggest this present monarch despite mm. how long she's been incumbent has come nowhere near it no um no. what happened in the late 1970s for example with mass unemployment um when margaret thatcher came in as the, as the first female prime minister and began to deconstruct this country wherever your political views and i try not to have any as such i'll make an observation is that the country was gutted absolutely gutted and the Queen under our constitution in the UK, our unwritten and therefore infinitely plastic constitution, infinitely corruptible constitution, still had the power to stop her, but she didn't. Yeah. A real monarch would have done. A real monarch would have stood up for the people and for the traditions of the, of the land and the, and the culture. She didn't. She still doesn't. And we get told she does it behind the scenes. Well, not a very good effect, it seems. Because following Margaret Thatcher, who basically, in my own personal opinion, stabbed this country in the heart, we got Tony Blair, a new, la new Labour, who effectively murdered its soul. So the two of them together did a really good job on the traditions of this country and on its identity culturally. 
and our monarch did nothing nothing at all so it shows um, we've lost it to some extent with you, still see, to you our... still see the need for it in people don't you, do, you? you do. despite the fact she doesn't live up to it it's still transferred it's, yes, still, it's projected. still transferred yeah. so there's a reason why that's sustained because when you think about it there is no actual conditioning or learning of our culture which supports the continuation of the monarchy mm. as being useful we're told it's symbolic as soon as you suggest that to a large group a social or a cultural group and they take that on board it's internalized as a collective representation it will then interface with the deep structure instincts which produce these roles in the first place as adaptations and then it sustains itself because of instinctive drift people's behavior collectively levels out and reduces down towards instincts you're seeing it now with covid and with lockdown People do that, that they, en masse, reduce or eliminate their individuality and become more collective. So it's far easier right now to maintain something like a monarchy over a, a culture than it would be during a time when things were thriving economically or culturally and there was a, there was a lot of energy going on in that way. Uh, the same thing happens in wars and in, in times of uh, depression and poverty or, or whatever. This country will have a royal wedding. You know, nice distraction. Yeah. Uh, keeps things controlled at a symbolic level, at an instinctive level. But if you're not conscious of your instincts, you'll fall victim to them. You'll fall victim to them negatively because they will control you. And in a more positive way, you'll fall victim to them because they will try to change your behaviour by you being out of kilter with what's natural and right for you. So you then have to make a decision about how you deal with those instincts consciously. And a conscious adaptation is not falling victim to archetypal imagery. That is a distraction that prevents you from doing it. So to become conscious is to know what instincts are and to see how close you are to what they intend and then how close what they intend is to what actually is the best adaptation that you can make for yourself as an individual. But go back to them. Don't neglect them. They won't neglect you. They'll come for you in a negative way if they have to, to gain your attention. So it's important, very, very important to understand the role of instinct. Well, you had it with uh, Princess Diana as well, didn't yeah, you? you did. And you talked about royal weddings and, yes. and such like being used as a, a kind of collective distraction. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and there was the Toxteth riots going on yep. around at the time. The worst, and uh, other, yes. the worst riot yes. in, in uh, modern mm. British history. Mm. In, in Merseyside and Liverpool, a thousand police officers were, mm. were hospitalised. Mm. Uh, I was one of them. Mm. Um, and I was taken out with a nice lump of concrete to the head the night before Diana Spencer's wedding. And that was in 1981, and I was already working part-time in a voluntary sense as a, as a psychotherapist at that time. <laughs> uh, and I remember being in a very dissociated state because I could see why it had happened. It wasn't just in, in, in Liverpool, it was in London, Bristol, yeah. Manchester, the whole country. Yeah, was ablaze. Was really. ablaze. Yeah. And they distracted us with this royal wedding and mm. how wonderful it was. Mm. You know? Terrible. The amount of poverty. Yes, there was a lot of crime, a lot of drugs, but that poverty was brought about by Margaret Thatcher. She deliberately plunged the country into a state where you would get this catabolic degeneration into an instinctive response on a, on a mass scale. And William Whitelaw, who was the Home Secretary at the time, visited Toxteth, um where a square mile of the city was, was demolished in, in, in flames and reported back to Margaret Thatcher that, she, that he thought a revolution was underway, mm. specifically in that city, uh, more than any other. It was just, just the way it was. Um, they were all bad, but that one was particularly bad in terms of, uh, of its breakout in violence. And I felt very, very dissociated from that because my natural inclination was to see that the police were there to serve the public and to, to be on the streets of my home city expected to fight with them you know when the, a lot of these people were just people who had been uh, compressed and had been hurt yeah. been disenfranchised discriminated against uh, i i did wonder i did wonder what on earth i'm doing there you know mm. even though as I, said, I was hit on the first night and then i was hit the, uh, I, might, I got away with that one wasn't too bad the second one though was nearly killed um, and yeah, I could understand. I could understand it. Terrible, terrible situation. Um, 
awful and, and that was again one of those moments where I was privileged if you like historically to see into a situation and evaluate it there I was wearing a uniform that had a badge on that said Elizabeth II E2R representing the Queen sovereignty and yes the forces of the Queen were repressing her own people well the land was on fire the land was on fire no terrible mm. um, awful really awful situation to be in mm. uh, for all of us really but a lot of my colleagues didn't see it that way and I had a, I had a, a neurotic split if you like from yeah. them over that that, that that you know no I don't see it this way don't see it this way at all I just had some very strange experiences um, four years before that I had a dream which was precognitive in which I saw it all happening yeah. and myself and I saw a Chinese family trapped in a, in a burning building. It was a specific building on the corner of a street, Upper Parliament Street, in Toxteff, in Liverpool. It was daylight, the whole street was on fire. That building was on fire and a Chinese family were there. The first night we were over there, it was still going on when the sun came up and there was that Chinese family in that building, in the exact window, trying to get out. And I, I'd had that dream four years before and I couldn't understand, I didn't know, you know, at the time, why should I have this dream? I was, I was and remain very closely connected to the Chinese community, but I didn't know that in Liverpool, but I didn't know that family. And there we were, a line across Upper Parliament Street with burning buildings. And there I was in exactly the same place with exactly the same view of exactly the same building. Makes you wonder, doesn't it? Mm. So, yeah, str strange things can happen. Uh, and that was an archetypal drama, if you like, in a narrative sense, but underpinning that with violent instincts and a failure of the culture to adjust to itself, except to try and dissipate people's feelings so they were distracted into this sham wedding, which it obviously was, yeah. but the, the vast majority of people just, just took it because the archetypal imagery was sufficient to suppress their instincts. You know, and this can happen in anyone's uh, circumstances. It's going on now. People are out there manipulating so called archetypal imagery and they are suppressing instincts en masse. So be careful. You can only do that for so long before there's a reaction from within.